And then I went to Rockstar North. Uh, I loved games. I went into games and I worked on three Grand Theft Autos. And after eight years of doing Grand Theft Auto, I went somewhere else. I, I needed a change of scenery and I went north to Finland and joined Remedy Games. And I did some art direction and world design on Quantum Break. And now I was a world design director on Control. So uh, in Remedy Games, it's uh, what is a world design director? It's one of those kind of amorphous titles. And uh, really, I'm a production designer. That's, that's where my passion lies. So, uh, so that's a crossing point between world art direction and uh, narrative design. There's a little bit of level design and uh, how to actually produce the levels in the world. And another thing I call technological lore which is where uh, I come up with some of the theories that, that kind of feeds into what we put into the world. But it's really about creating the potential space for the other disciplines, like narrative and uh, gameplay, and then working with them to kind of give them what they need in the game. And it's a lot to do with uh, working very closely with the art director, the creative director, and the game director. And it's uh, really pre-production focused. That's where I do most of my work on a, on a project. So Control, uh, Hopefully most of you have played it. And uh, it's uh, basically, the, I'd give the, a kind of brief premise. It's about Jesse Faden, who arrives at this uh, fictitious uh, government uh, Bureau of Control. And the Federal Bureau of Control investigates, uh, contains and uh, researches the paranatural. And when she turns up, she's looking for answers to do with her mysterious past uh, and her childhood. But at the same time, a force known as the Hiss has invaded the, the building and killed the, the director. And now through means, she becomes the director herself and is tasked with protecting the bureau and its secrets within. So the game's entirely set within one building, which is the, uh, the oldest house. And the question is, what is the oldest house? Well, in uh, late 2018 in production, we released a world trailer. So I'll play that for you now because this does a far better uh, job of explaining what the oldest house is than I can. So, um, the oldest house, it's a brutalist monolithic uh, skyscraper in the center of New York and very early in pre-production, this is a, a mat that I created just to kind of get the, the kind of setting across. But the funny thing is that uh, one of our references actually was a monolithic brutalist uh, skyscraper in lower Manhattan, which is this building, the 33 Thomas Street, known as the Long Lines. And it was created as a telephone exchange during the Cold War and it's built to withstand a nuclear war. And this was a, a really good starting point for us uh, as the location for the oldest house. And the main thing was that the architectural style was brutalism. And this suggestion came from the game director, uh, Mikhail Kastorinen, and he suggested brutalism. And it came at a really good point because 
It's uh, gained new appreciation uh, through social media and photography. And actually, uh, neo-brutalism is beginning to appear again in, uh, in architecture recently. So uh, to, to go through brutalism very, very briefly for you, I'll give you like a little pocket history of it. So it really started with this building, which is kind of proto-brutalism, uh, which is a unité de habitation in Marseille. And its uh, architect was the greatest architect in the 20th century, probably, Le Corbusier. And he coined a term for this uh, style, which is uh, beton brut, which is uh, raw concrete and uh, an attention to structural expression. And then it moved on, uh, brutalism started off, it, it became more of a social housing, post-war social housing thing. And then it finally became more of a global phenomenon and it uh, moved into universities as well, other institutions. So this is the Andrews building, which was a major uh, influence for us on control. We use it as a, a fantastic reference and it's, it's here in, in Canada, it's uh, Toronto University. And then brutalism was also adopted by governments Another strong reference, reference for us was Boston City Hall. And eventually Washington DC adopted the style quite widely, uh, especially with the FBI headquarters. So that further solidified uh, the attachment of brutalism to government. But it wasn't just uh, real life and architecture. Obviously film has adapted brutalism to represent totalitarianism and dystopia and power. And it's probably started with this guy, with Stanley Kubrick uh, on Clockwork Orange. He used uh, two sites in London. He used the Brunel University and also Thamesmead Housing Estate to represent this kind of future, uh, future dystopia. So we had, had the pop media, uh, pop culture influence of, uh, of the kind of dystopia and architectural power and also the government uh, relevance with uh, real life uh, architecture for brutalism. So it's feel, it felt like a really good fit for the, uh, the oldest house. And one of the art, world art direction uh, uh, guides we also had was this concept of contrast and surprise. And we had it with things like order and chaos and the mundane, which was the, the bureau as well, and the weird, the hiss had this fluidic, uh, chaotic nature to it, and stability and solidity with entropy and change. And the reason for this is, like horror movies, you, you tend to try and build this... Uh, foundation of, of the mundane or the believable and then you have these high points of drama uh, so you need that contrast in order to get uh, a lot of emotion out of the out of the viewer and we did this really to kind of help drive the weird i mean new weirds a very difficult concept to convey and one example is the uh, building shifting which you can see in the game and the original concept came from sam lake the, the creative director he described the bureau as a shifting place and uh, from that was his influence on, uh, uh, from a book called uh, A House of Leaves. And the concept was that the building would shift floor plans and, and it would change dimensions in a kind of strange way. And I created this original concept, this little uh, illustration map, really to kind of explore how the Bureau would cope with, with this uh, mysterious shifting and changing. And it's the concept that a bureaucracy tries to stick a label on the unknown in order to gain control over it and uh, comprehension. And then here's another, another illustration of the kind of mundane meets the weird, uh, uh, the, uh, the kind of water cooler delivery guys confounded by this, this uh, sudden shift in the building. But that didn't give us the most dramatic effects we needed in game. We needed a bigger visual payoff for the player when uh, you say took control back from the, the hiss in certain areas of the building using a control point. And for that, the art director and the VFX team developed this much more dynamic uh, system using Houdini uh, and uh, using it to calculate the uh, effect and change on the building shells on some of the rooms. And for this, brutalism actually gave us a really good foundation because it gives us this solidity that, that gives us, again, contrast and surprise against this impossibility of shift and change. So we've chosen brutalism. And in order to teach the, uh, the artists, the environment artists, how to build this world and keep it cohesive, I created this little primer, and this was a kind of primer called Be Brutal, and this is the title of the talk as well. And then it had six uh, key essential kind of ingredients to, to the flavor of brutalism I wanted for control. And with that, there was some reference and some key statements to take away. And this was a, really a concept of giving the artists really simple tools in which to build the world with. So the first element was mass. 
And with this, I've expanded the talk and I'll actually show you some examples and take you the through the development of some of these early spaces. So uh, brutalism, uh, mass is uh, one of the kind of main things you can associate with brutalism. It's these uh, huge sculptural uh, massive uh, shapes. And, and uh, in order to actually outline that, there's a lot of uh, interplay with uh, void. So the first space I actually designed for control was the boardroom. The thing is, for the director, this is his court to rule over. And uh, this is a place where power plays out in the bureau. So in development of this, I started to develop this crushing mass that, that, that dominated the table. And it created this uh, sense of intensity in the space between the, the mass and the, and the table itself. And you notice there in the bottom corner, I've actually got a note that says war room. And the reason why is one of the main influences with this was actually one of the most famous sets in film, which is the war room from Dr. Strangelove. Again, more Kubrick, you'll see more of them in this talk. And uh, this, this was a kind of major influence in me. And also uh, the production designer, Ken Adam, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the industry legends and he came from an architectural background as well. And you see a lot of heavily architectural influenced uh, the set designs from him, especially in the Bond movies from the 60s. So this is a, one of the early concepts I created that really solidified the design for me. You had the crushing mass and then I lifted the table up towards to meet the mass, which uh, in further intensified that, that space between the, the, the light box and the table. And another thing I did was actually to look at the, uh, to look at the imagery of uh, your classic wood paneled executive spaces and recreate that in brutalism. So you have this paneling that's actually created with a, in, in the concrete. And in game, it actually becomes a bit of a war room for Jesse because this is where she meets uh, she meets a uh, pope, and they, they discuss the that she discovers more about the bureau and discusses how to take back the the bureau from the uh, from the hiss. And another early space that that was uh, to do with exploration of the architecture really was the hub, and this is the hub for executive sector. And this is probably the second space I designed for the, for the the game. And uh, this actually features a character from the, from the game or a motif, which is the Black Pyramid. And this actually came around from a, an early uh, symbol that the art director had developed, which was a, an inverted triangle. And later that became an inverted dark triangle. And I wanted to give that some physicality because I like this occult symbology. So I created the Black Pyramid for this space. And at the same time, I was exploring ritualism in the architecture and repetition. And interestingly, when you see the, the, gate, the uh, pyramid for the first time in the game, the lighting artist did a fantastic job of all, almost recollecting that, that uh, initial uh, inspiration from the, the triangular shape. And in game, you can see it, it, it survived uh, fro from the original concepts. And this black pyramid uh, has dominion over, the, uh, over the, the grand seal of the bureau. And this gained more significance when we came to develop the astral plane. And uh, the board of the of the uh, the bureau became this this pyramid. So, in retrospect, it started to give this kind of significance of dominion over the over the bureau. And then, probably another early example of the the use of space and mass and, and void was the entrance itself. Uh, for this, what I wanted to do is really recreate that. Um, hiding in plain sight was one of the things we thought about the oldest house that it would hide behind the mundane. So this was a sort of recollection of government lobbies everywhere where you have this uncomfortable feeling you don't want to be in this space because there's a feeling of uh, observation and exposure from being in these empty, empty kind of uh, foyer areas. And part of this influence for the entrance is actually bunker architecture. Uh, this will appear again later on. So you have this huge concrete, evidence, uh, huge concrete mass, which is uh, like an architecture of control itself. And then there's this slot cut in it. And then when you see the, the final version in game, we took that further, the proportions are, are almost more crushed on the, the entrance space. And we introduced this large um, entrance canopy, which kind of enhances a sense of mass pressing down on the entrance to the oldest house. So the second element was structure. And structural expression's a thing in brutalism. Um, they, they tend to make use of cantilevered floor plates and, and, and uh, structural beams. 
And using this device, it was another way for us to drive out the, the use of columns in the space. And early concepts I created were, were to do with repetition and this idea of almost like a kind of ritualistic treatment of structure. But one of the things you notice in the game is that there is a lack of structural columns in a lot of the spaces. And this is a really deliberate move because it keeps the architecture quite clean and pure. But it also keeps the view lines for the game uh, clean and pure. And as well, when it comes to traversal, we have levitation. So being able to kind of move between floor, floor plates without columns in the way actually made it a lot easier. And you can see the use of uh, deep structural beams to support these uh, ceiling features so that we don't need columns in the space. And another feature was uh, the deliberate choice of uh, driving forward a, a very orthogonal design. Early on, a lot of the artists wanted, wanted to introduce these very whimsical uh, angles, and it had this very kind of sci-fi trope, this kind of Sid Mead type, type look to it. And this is something I wanted to remove and to keep the world very orthogonal. And this spoke of the bureaucracy and, and the, the bureau, but also when we come to the more fluidic and chaotic nature of, of what's taking over the bureau with the hiss, and uh, some of the twisting and shape-shifting of the building itself. We got much more contrast. Again, it's that notion of contrast and surprise. And uh, perhaps one of the largest structures in the game is, is the fire breaks themselves. These are like huge cantilevered beams, beams. And we have these impossible voids that run through the building. And the original intention for this was actually a, more of a world design problem I had, that we were building this sandbox world and it's all internal. And some of the devices you would normally use for navigation are taken away from you then. We don't have castles on, on uh, mountain tops or, or peaks that we can use. So we don't have vista and, and uh, landmark that we can use in this kind of world. So the idea with the fire breaks was uh, originally like a canal on a, in a city. The player would cross them and orientate themselves with this. And that, got, that was one of the things that maybe least successful. It was lost over time with the organic growth of the levels. But we still kept these spaces in because they provide these really remarkable architectural downbeats in the game where, where uh, you get this pause between areas in the game. And the audio team did a really good job of creating this very dampened sense of mood. And this is one of the kind of uh, world building stories behind this. Uh, research is a big thing in, in Remedy. And we always try to do quite deep and wide research. And I was looking for a material uh, on the inside of the fire breaks. You see this cladding material. And I was looking for a material the Bureau would use physically as a form of shielding against the paranatural. Physicality was one of our game pillars. And I came across this material, which is magnetite. And it had a really interesting backstory because it actually bridges the occult and the scientific. On the occult side, it's known as lodestone, and it's uh, used for occult divination. But then on the scientific side, it's used in powdered format and used in uh, concrete as radioactive shielding. So the interesting thing, just like the Bureau uh, bridges the occult and tries to study it in the scientific, so this material did the same. So from this, uh, we actually, actually created what was known as black rock in the, in the game. And we needed a place where the Bureau got this material from. So I had this thought of uh, creating a quarry within the, uh, the thresholds, which is where dimensions bleed into the oldest house. And then again, with the, the pillar of uh, contrast and change within the world art direction, uh, the environment artist and the concept artist did a fantastic job of creating the, the quarry. But then I wanted a starry sky in there because you're in this claustrophobic interior world. It was really nice to give the surprise and, and contrast when the ceiling suddenly lifted and you saw this alien starry sky. Um, I have to say big thank you to the concept artist for painting all those stars. It, it was a hard, hard job for them. And uh, again, structure uh, and brutalism. Brutalism gave us a lot as well. With the uh, Boston City Hall, I noticed that they use this thing called a waffle ceiling, which is like an open three-dimensional grid. And Boston City Hall retooled that in various different ways. You had large public spaces, courtrooms and offices, and through lighting and, and different scales, they, they, had, uh, they used it for different spaces. So our world was built on a four-meter grid. We used modules, but we also used uh, bespoke building shells for uh, certain rooms. So using the four-meter grid, we created a whole different... Uh, set of, uh, set of um, ceiling units. I created this little sketch model to explore and show the team how we could actually retool it to create different moods and, uh, and different uh, uses for the spaces. And in fact, ceilings actually became a, something of an architectural playground for us because it's the one space that least impacted gameplay. 
and uh, we used it for a variety of expressive ways, like the mail tree, uh, the mail trees in the, the mail room, and uh, other things like the pipe, the crazy pipe work in, in the uh, basement areas, and uh, certain kind of ceiling details as well. So the third is uh, depth. And depth was uh, more the expression of thickness and weight within the architecture. And uh, this is used in things like Carlos Scarpa and, and Le Corbusier again, with the Ronchamp uh, Chapel. And one of the influences with this is uh, got me thinking about Scottish tower houses, being Scotsman. Um, I was thinking about castles. And one thing about the bureau with the oldest house, it felt to me it was like a castle for the weird or a prison for the weird. That's why I introduced things like the panopticon, which is a form of kind of a prison through observation. And uh, with this also, I discovered that another brutalist architect, uh, Louis Kahn, actually did a lot of sketches and studied the castles too, because I had an interesting thing where the living space was surrounded with ancillary space that was quite organically built into the wall, the thickness of the wall. So taking this kind of thick wall um, concept, I did an original concept for the, uh, for the research hub. And the research hub, again, with contrast and, and surprise, I introduced these redwood trees and it was a way to surprise the player and kind of accentuate the sense of scale with this, this huge void. But more importantly, I actually created this, um, this, uh, this stairway, this processional stairway that spiraled around the space. And that created this thick wall and this mass of concrete that, that uh, shielded the, uh, the hub from the research spaces beyond. And the artist, uh, Masawa, environment artist, did a really great job on this. It was a huge environment to work in. And you can even see echoes of the original kind of Scottish castle kind of uh, expression of thickness in some of the upper areas. So the, uh, the next larger one uh, element compared to mass, it's a similar thing, is surface. And for that, it was divided into two principles. One was uh, texture and the other one was, uh, uh, was articulation. And articulation was really kind of expression of the difference between the textures. So first, texture. Uh, one of the things you notice with brutalism, it's predominantly concrete, but it actually creates quite a diverse palette with that concrete through surface treatment. You usually have smooth concrete and then there's paneling and chiseling and, and even the, and the, the principle of structural expression, you actually get the, uh, the wooden boarding that they actually create the molds to pour the concrete out. That gets left to actually show how the space was built. And for that, we actually created all, about 50 different concretes. We became these connoisseurs of concrete. And uh, certain areas had their own, their own kind of sets. And also we had a, quite a range of different textural treatments. And the artists were told to kind of take, take two or three concretes and try their best to express the interior and only then add more because I really wanted to avoid this, this patchwork um, kind of uh, overuse of, of different materials within the same space. And it wasn't just concrete. Louis Kahn, the, the, the guy that sketched the castles and was influenced by them, he had this interesting uh, blend of traditionalism and concrete modern. And uh, that was a really good inspiration when we came to do the, uh, the executive sector. I really wanted to kind of echo those corridors of power, the kind of wood paneled traditional executive uh, look. And this is an early kind of palette concept I created where, where we experimented with the wooden palette, uh, wooden uh, panels and then some of these brass details are actually from an, inspired by an architect called uh, Carlo Scarpa that we'll get to later. And also things like uh, symmetry and, and this use of this deep red carpet had this kind of ceremonial and uh, ritualistic feel to the, to the executive sector. And we also introduced these uh, brutalist cast metal panels and it was to give some material difference to the diffuse concrete, but also allowed the artists something that they could actually use in, uh, in several kind of uh, Area, more public areas to give some kind of uh, focus point. And also they still stuck to this uh, orthogonal uh, usage for the kind of main structure for the, the building. And the second part is articulation, which is really expressing the texture difference in, in the world by little kind of steps and shadow gaps and grooves. And you can see it in, a, for instance, in a Andrews building in Toronto University, you can see them use this principle you have the kind of boarded uh, surface for the walls and then this smooth concrete for the structure. And there's actually these kind of subtle movements and steps in the surface that actually really kind of help accentuate that and add more readability to the, to the space. And this is something we tried in, in the, the game as well, communications uh, area and the executive sector. 
we use this chiseled concrete, but then you see there's these shadow gaps and grooves cut in in order to kind of accentuate the, the structure. And we use the, the smooth concrete for the kind of beam work and columns. Um, and that, this is something we try to pay attention to is, is expression of uh, texture and, uh, and pattern. And talking about surfacing, the, one of the fights that we kind of had very early on to try and overcome is this fear of the blank wall that environment artists have. Traditionally, we always used a lot of detail and stick uh, decals on and a lot of granularity on surfaces. But this was a very architectural world. And I wanted us to think about composition and architectural space first and then drive uh, the expression of that through lighting. So the, the environment artists had to kind of restrain from uh, over detailing the wall surfaces. And to be fair, they were working in the dark, literally at the start, because until lighting passes came in, it gave them more confidence to actually believe in the, the approach we, were, we had for the architecture. Which kind of gives me this kind of little aside, which is, um, which is really about uh, this quality is not always quantity uh, philosophy. And architectures kind of learned this. These are both beautiful churches in their own right. One's Baroque and the other one's concrete modern. And this is by Tadeo Ando, who's who's uh, described as a kind of master of light. And this is a, this has kind of been achieved through advances in technology and uh, a diversity of taste in architecture. And games is kind of heading that way too. I mean, when normal mapping came in, you got this more kind of more is more kind of Baroque style up here. But now with lighting technology like PBR and uh, real-time ray tracing and GI, we're actually getting this chance to actually architecturally express ourselves in games. And it's kind of really kind of exciting turning point for us and something we could achieve and control. And good lighting technology is one thing. We've got that with Northlight, but good lighting direction is another. And the art director and the lighting team did a fantastic job here. And they, they can expressionist use of, uh, of, of kind of expressing the, the uh, supernatural worked really well. And this is something for them to tell this story. I'm not going to recover this in detail. One thing I will cover, though, is the, the combination of light and architecture. And this really added to the cohesive world. Um, you can see how with the use of area lights, it was something we didn't have before. We could suddenly start creating Kevin Roche inspired kind of uh, ceiling lighting, or we could use uh, slot lighting in order to wash walls, or we could create quite interesting lighting features. And another psychological trick we used is the feeling that the, out the outside world was only an arm's reach away. I mean, it was an internal claustrophobic world. So actually having the device for actually letting you feel as if there was a skylight where sunlight was streaming in at times actually gave you some relief from that. And of course, this cleanliness actually helped us with the contrast. Again, contrast and surprise. Uh, when it came to destruction, we had this comprehensive destruction in the game world. You really kind of to get the kind of uh, impact from that. You wanted these clean, meticulous kind of spaces because when it comes to combat, two minutes later, it's going to be chaos and granularity. So the last two elements are, are uh, ritualized architecture. This is where we stray away from brutalism and, and head more towards uh, a more decorative element that kind of approaches the, the control and the idea of ritual. And the first one's repetition. We had this concept in the, in the game of, a, of a ritual through repetition and recursion. Things like the rule of three and numeracy and even bureaucracy is a ritualistic thing itself. You've got to fill out forms and triplicate and so, so the bureau is a ritualistic entity in itself. So the concept of recursion, we, uh, I remembered an architect from uh, my architectural training days of Carlo Scarpa, and he's a concrete architect, not necessarily a brutalist one because he has these uh, decorative elements. And I remembered in his uh, Brion Cemetery, he had this very obsessive attention to detail with these stepping elements that would turn up surfaces. And you can see this motif appear all over the building. And also, again, back to bunker architecture. It was an architecture of control and power, which kind of suited the bureau almost in a way. And we have these embrasures, which is this uh, stepping, uh, stepping in, in the concrete structures. So I introduced this into the world. And you can see, you can see that this in uh, the hub space, especially where these columns bear sort of witness to the, the play between the, the pillar and the great seal. And, and an approach to the war room, the, sort of, uh, the boardroom, you have the stepping again onto column edges and this, uh, this kind of stepped doorway that re leads to the boardroom itself. And the last element is symmetry. And this is again this idea of ritual and procession that we try to introduce into the world. But also, 
our old friend Kubrick again. Uh, we're big fans of his work. And especially The Shining, I, I like the use of one point perspective. He uses it in all his, mov all his movies. But especially in The Shining, it kind of uh, pulls the player away from the conveying reality and then gives you this kind of sense of intent and otherness. And it's something I really wanted to capture for the, for the game itself as well. So we have a lot of one point perspective uh, in the game. And it's interesting because it goes almost against, uh, against kind of modern uh, level design theory of uh, affordances, because this is, uh, this is giving you the choice of, of two, basically uh, putting choice down to two dimensions, forward or back. And uh, it's a, again, an architecture of control, the kind of theme of the, of the game really. So, so uh, one point perspective became something we repeated through the world. And you can see it in early concepts for the director's office. Um, incidentally, the shining kind of a uh, hedge maze is one of the textures used in the carpet there. Um, for the furnace, the furnace, I asked, asked the artist, uh, let's create a Mayan, a Mayan kind of sacrificial temple almost. So we have this furnace and this processional steel that leads up. And indeed in the game, there's a side quest where you can actually commit sacrifices to it. Uh, and the, the one point perspective helped present that. And again, we have a cathedral for the mail room. And they're using the pneumatic mail pipe trees as, uh, as columns. So to conclude, I'd actually kind of cover a, a concept illustration I created very early on. And this actually space never appears in the game. The ritual hub has echoes of it, but this is actually created more as an illustration of, of these elements. So we had mass and these massive elements kind of bearing down into the room. But then we had structure and the use of these beams to avoid the use of columns and their kind of thickness and the depth of structure to them. And then there was depth and, uh, and the, the idea of this, this doorway punching through the kind of thickness of the outer wall. And surface, we have these unadorned um, kind of honesty of material surfaces. And again, repetition, the, the uh, ritualistic repetition and stepping is, is in the concept. And we also have the waffle ceiling, the, the, the way of retooling it for different lighting, and the, uh, the idea of the sense of daylight streaming in for, into the room. And of course, finally, we've got symmetry. If you approach the room from this end, it seems to draw you towards the, the exit at the end of the space. So um, I guess we need some takeaways. So these are kind of, most of these are general takeaways that I use for every project. I use them for Quantum Break as well. And one of the things we do in Remedy is this concept of broad and deep research and reference. And I always say to cast the net wide is to look beyond games. Um, for instance, in, in Quantum Break, we looked at how time was conveyed in different art forms to, to develop the time VFX. And this, we actually looked, looked very broadly into architecture and how brutalism worked in, in the game in order to create this very cohesive sense of world. Another thing is the, the Be Brutal presentation itself. It's very simple and a contentious point, which other, other people might argue on, is that people don't read art Bibles. If you create an art Bible that's 60 or 70 sheets long, a lot of artists, I can guarantee you, won't really take it in. Um, what you need to do is give them a set of distilled tools to work with. The leads and the directors need art Bibles. Give, give the, the team the tools they need to work, and then the next thing is to trust them to take those tools forward and actually build a world with it and just help direct them when, when things think they're getting confused or, or there's some of the principles don't seem clear. And the other thing that we learned from Control is to not fear simplicity. Um, don't fear the terror of the open wall. Think more architecturally on form and, and think about lighting beyond that. And on, on that note, trust your lighting team to make a beautiful game. I mean, our team on Control did an awesome job and, and it, it really is, is the other half of, of the architecture and the world itself. And uh, the last one is uh, that making a, a, a weird world is fun, but it really is harder than you think. I think the contrast and sur uh, surprise element really worked well, but I have to say a big grat uh, debt of gratitude to the game director and Sam Lake, the creative director. Those guys really accepted a lot of the bizarre stuff I threw at them. Like for instance, the motel, um, suggesting a, a motel ritual in the middle of, uh, middle of a brutalist building was a strange thing. Um, a black rock quarry, uh, impossible voids that run through the building. All those things um, we suggested and, and those guys just kind of went with and, and they really kind of made it their own and wrote, and, and wrote a beautiful story to kind of run through that game. So 
Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, New Weird is difficult. It's a very difficult concept for people to get in their heads. And, uh, and uh, hopefully all this kind of uh, development helped to build this cohesive world. And hopefully a lot of you guys have got to enjoy it as well. Thank you. to a Q&A short group is where they're more. Can you hear me? Test, can you hear me? If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll go first here. Uh, hi. So the UI uh, complements the, the brutalist style really well in the game. Did, did you have any influence on that? Just talk, yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, um, well, really early on when it came to the development of the look of the bureau, uh, one of the things we actually do as well, which is very uh, almost like the way a film production company works, is we, we, we hire experts from outside to work with us. And for Quantum Break and Control, we, we hired the graphic, both times we hired the graphic design company to help develop the look and the brand. So the kind of badge of the bureau you see developed by that graphic design company. And me and the, the art director and, and, and others in the company worked with them to really kind of develop that look and feel and the kind of font choices and such. So, and the kind of look of that, the, the kind of a documentation. And the, the UI and UX team kind of ran with that and, it, and kind of helped create this kind of bureaucratic vibe for the game. So in the talk, you focused a lot on the structure, kind of shape and texture of concrete. There are two versions of control out there. There's the standard version and there's the RTX version on PC that brings in a kind of transformative layer in terms of reflections and glossy surfaces. When you were designing the layout of the maps, kind of the visual space of the world, did you have to take that into account that this might add another element on top that was in contrast to the core visual design pillars? Um, the quick answer is no. <laughs> Um, RTX is something that came along. We started developing well before then, and then we had a we, we developed a relationship with uh, with Nvidia and, and and got that. And it's great because we got to um, we got to kind of play around and get better lighting. And one of the best things about about the uh, ray tracing that I really liked, uh, and it's something that's not reflections. Reflections are always the showy thing that everyone goes after. One of the best things about the ray tracing is contact shadows is that the world just feels more grounded and more connected. And you actually get fall off on the shadows as well. So you get the sharpness at contact point and then the shadows fall away. So one of the subtle things that people don't notice at first, but they subconsciously kind of take in when they look at an image, is this uh, feeling of much more solidity. Hi there. Uh, I was just curious with the uh, kind of contrast you were going for with the brutalist architecture as well as the uh, aspects of the paranormal side. Um, what kind of inspirations did you take to kind of uh, create create a lot of diversity in that contrast of like um, having these different paranormal uh, thresholds? Uh, just kind of what inspiration or what influence did you have with kind of like uh, examining that and what kind of I guess just like I don't really know how to keep it concise, but yeah. I'm on thresholds. I'm going to enjoy talking about this. Um, actually, actually, one of the early concepts was um, I did the, an office covered in moss, which is kind of inspired by those uh, Japanese kind of moss gardens, uh, temple gardens, and uh, that eventually grew into the literally, <laughs> excuse the pun, grew into the the mold area for the threshold. And that actually goes back to the, the thing we talked about, the contrast between uh, uh, solidity and entropy and change. And the concept, concept of the, uh, the game pillar of physicality in the world was that the kind of magic in the world would have a very physical uh, impact. 
So that's why a lot of the thresholds have this kind of uh, entropic kind of a uh, change of substance to them. So that that's why you get the mold and, and such there. Hi. Um, so I wanted to know what was the uh, main challenge you have to encounter when it comes to work with level de designers, mostly in terms of um, gameplay space and uh, guidance with the light, with the, with the, the space and the archi architectures. Um, well, I mean, originally I was, I was uh, dealing with the, the layout and level design side as well. Um, I kind of spread myself quite thin usually. <laughs> uh, so we did a lot of uh, spatial uh, spatial diagrams originally to actually get the kind of connections between the world. And we had this concept of kind of kind of similar to hub and spoke system of, of uh, layout of the world. Um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, there is there is kind of uh, some amount of the lighting direction is 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 uses uh, sort of is for the level design. Um, but the, the other thing was that it was a sandbox world we we're creating, so you're kind of free to explore as well. So we didn't really want to handhold the player to that extent a lot of the time. But you do see like doors that have got functional lights that are kind of on or off, and, and there's, there's kind of functional lighting in there too. Uh, but I mean, the actual le level design was actually created quite abstractly, and then we moved into uh, creating the uh, the um, mission spaces were kind of organically growing out of these uh, these hub spaces. It's kind of a follow-up question, but um, did you work with the level designer to have choke points during the gameplay to have the best view possible the first time you see a new room, a new environment? Um, but yeah, kind of, I guess we, we tend to kind of think architecturally, so, so presentation of vista and viewpoint kind of comes instinctively. Um, so kind of a lot of the, a lot of the kind of spaces were, were kind of presented because that's the way we designed them so so it kind of worked that way naturally really with the architectural design um when you work as an architect uh, you, you have to kind of it's like a level designer you, you have to think of how to present readable spaces to people so um so it kind of it kind of just is kind of in the back of my brain all the time to work that way You described kind of like a really organic back and forth between story and what you guys were doing in the environment. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Was there a script that you were working off of from the beginning? It sounds like you were going back and forth quite a bit, which is cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, the level designers, we, we did an initial pass on the world and, and like I said, the spatial diagrams to get the kind of functionality in the world. And uh, some of the key hub spaces were, were really just expressions of the how the world worked, you know, like research hubs and, and uh, the kind of uh, executive hubs and such. And then, then with the level design, they would have missions they wanted to create. So then they would create these organic, more organic chains of spaces away from the hubs and connect to the other hubs. And we had set certain high points that we uh, we would want to create, like uh, journeying to the foundation or or uh, finding the hedron, so the hedron chamber uh, went through quite a lot of design. And uh, so we kind of knew there was these kind of bigger beats and then, and then the uh, level designer could string kind of mission spaces between those bigger beats. I mean, we're, the good thing about working modular, uh, they actually could had a lot of Legos they could basically create spaces out of. And then uh, there was more bespoke room shells that are more architecturally kind of sensitive that we created. Or sometimes I would actually create those shells and then give them to the environment artist after architecturally creating them. They would put them in the uh, in 3D Studio Max and uh, they'd be about three centimeters tall because I'm terrible for not working to scale. So an apology to them, Ode. <laughs> I was curious what of all of the different kinds of, of layouts in the in the bureau, what was your particular favorite department or area to design if you had one? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, I guess to some extent it's the executive sector as well with the, the boardroom and the hub because they were the first two spaces I architecturally designed myself and they kind of set the tone of the of the symmetry and ritualism and defined all those kind of elements to the architecture. And it set up the weirdness of the, the Black Pyramid. I mean, I love the fact that it became the, the board. Uh, it's just such a kind of weird concept from Sam and, uh, and it, it was kind of nice. It became this entity that spoke about three different sentences at once. So. So that that was pretty cool. Um, the the uh, the the quarry as well. I just liked the fight the quarry the way it turned out, and I didn't have anything really to do with it um, at the end visuals. I mean, I just wanted a starry sky and I wanted a black rock quarry, but the guys did a really good job, and it echoes the brutalism a little bit with those floating black rock columns, and that was quite cool. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of kind of little kind of beats all around that, that kind of felt really kind of special. Um, so I mean, I, I think I think there's like one or two rooms that, that I, I designed myself that I kind of liked, and I liked getting some of the systems in, like the uh, the safe rooms and stuff like that. Um, a, a different talk would be talking about the the world design, just things like technological lore. There's a whole story about how I came I came up with the uh, the idea of physicalized information. That's why the mail pipes are there, and and uh, there's a whole idea of that kind of um, solidity against entropy. So um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of kind of favorite little kind of bits and pieces in the world. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, thanks a lot for coming, guys. Thank you for coming to the Mega Mix. We're gonna ask you to leave the space because we've got to change it up. Make sure you leave your headphones out and thank you again for coming. You can